Can you, can you see the image there? Estelle, that's crazy. I mean, I mean how, how early no, is I'm it? In is it uh, are you in Dusseldorf? I'm in Dusseldorf. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, not dramatic. That's our time. Um, yeah, that's, that's all the members. Pardon? Uh, that's all today, like not six people. No, but... no actually, we're waiting for Esther Sabo. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. here we have your map. Okay. Uh, don't explain. Just, I mean, if you integrate it into your uh, short speech, uh, <clears throat> mention it, show it, and go on. Uh, Karen, we have like three, four minutes for every speaker to, you know, give a position on, on this issue of identity. Uh, I treat identity very much as part of, of a kind of institutional field. So mm -hmm. we all feel that the, 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 the role of art in society is, is under heavy change. Um, it's, it's not any longer the lone, lonely artist, the visionary producing a work which then is, you know, uh, acclaimed and, and sold. But the artist is much more integrated in society uh, a member of a society, and uh, so uh, in member of society in political terms, in terms of uh, criticality and support, in terms of being part of, of local communities. Some of you work very much with craft, uh, carpets, ceramics, stuff like that. And, uh, and, and might be as producers of a specific type of embodied knowledge. So <clears throat> the question is, uh, how, how does that hold for your artistic identity? And uh, so the question is, what, what can you do? How can you contribute? Um, and, and maybe at the end, uh, does the old system of selling still work? I mean... Uh, we're missing an artist who is just a performer who's relying on fees more than on, on sales. So, so that would be a little bit the direction. I think we yeah. shouldn't take identity in the way, how do you feel, Karen Seiter? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's... it's a Twitter, not Seiter. Twitter, okay. Yeah. Good. Good. How much time do we have? We have three minutes to go. Mm -hmm. And then I will say a few words at the beginning. And then, Karen, you might start if we follow an alphabetic order in terms oh, really? of titles. And... <laughs> Good. Uh, fine. So Carlos just, appeared to be the first one, but <laughs> yeah. I was even complaining to mutual friends, Karen. Yeah, she, yeah. she ran away. She's refusing. <laughs> what? Let's what? just say that you'll hear from our mutual friends asking why you didn't show up to a meeting at six in the morning. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. All good. Yeah, it's, it took me some time to understand how to get in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also, yeah, I was doing other things. And, yeah, morning stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> we have another minute, and then we should go. Go live. Yeah. No problem. I think we don't have many views anyhow, so 
<laughs> you never know. There might be countries where it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. It's oh, lunch. Then they, yeah, then they people are very bored. This <laughs> video um, also gonna be the on the YouTube, right? In the future. Ah, okay, good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, archives. <laughs> archives, exactly. Okay, <laughs> colleagues, I'm going live now. Behave. <laughs> <laughs> So from the like in one two minutes we start recording. Yeah, we we're live yeah, now yeah. and and we are recording. Sure. Good. So good morning, whoever listens listens in the world. Good morning also to the four guest artists uh, who joined this this very early meeting. Uh, there's Karen Sitter. In the moment in Düsseldorf, there's Carlos Noronha Feier um, in Portugal, aren't you? No, yes, I, yeah. I am in the moment, at moment in Portugal. Uh, there's Tessonari from Japan, but now in Prague. Yeah. Um, and there's Lodi Rodriguez uh, in the US. So we have a very international community here of internationally or operating artists. Our question is uh, how to be an artist today. And it's connected apparently to a specific uh, search for a new identity. Um, we all witness that uh, the art as a system is heavily changing. Uh, we notice it from the art market Uh, the old value system we followed through modernity apparently doesn't work any longer. The idea that here uh, you're paid for inventing the future. If you have a good idea, your work will sell, doesn't work any longer. Uh, other rules took over. So this is only one symptom of a market. Another symptom of the change of the institution is the growing impact of performative practices. So the whole institution, social institution of art apparently changes as society changes. Now, our question today is, how do I find a new identity, a new role in this developing system? And actually, nobody knows what will be the outcome of the system change. What we can uh, understand is that the 19th century role of the artist as an outsider and the artist as the lone uh, innovator, it has gone. And, and also the, the, the importance of the male innovator is lost. Um, what we notice is that artists more and more become servants to a society. And we, we see that they try hard to be part of communities Um, there's a specific role of craft in the moment. And of course, it's not just using craft, but with craft, you are entering a specific local tradition, a specific local practice. We see a strong political engagement. It's nearly impossible today to do art, which is not also a political statement. A lot of artists stopped even producing works and support uh, politically NGOs or local communities. Criticality has become a very, very important issue of visual arts. And then, and Ted Zonari, who just finished his PhD in Prague, uh, it might be an example here. Um, there, there is a new consciousness of a specific artistic knowledge, a kind of embodied knowledge, And there's a new exchange across the border between science and arts. Uh, and, and also here something new is developing. Now, I want to invite our artists to give a short statement to these questions, to tell us where they position themselves in these changes. And then uh, we all want to use the opportunity to ask questions. We know each other a little bit, but not so much. And so it's a beautiful opportunity to learn more about the other. I would propose, uh, in alphabetically order, uh, it touches uh, Karen Sitter, 
Karen, would you comment on these issues of searching for an identity? Uh, sure. Uh, so for me, it's not really, there is not much a, a choice because I never, like, it was never like I didn't choose the title to be an artist. I just did what I did and wherever it took me in life, that's wherever I went. So uh, I see the changes and the shifts, but uh, I cannot, I'm not trying to be an artist. So whatever I mm -hmm. do, I'm just trying to, I'm like, I see myself more of a professional unemployed. Uh, so <laughs> what I do is whatever it takes me. So what I did, like I did, I studied art for two years in Israel and then my father had a camera, so I started to make videos. And then uh, I applied for a scholarship and I got to Amsterdam. I didn't enjoy it so much, so I moved to Berlin. And videos, my videos attracted attention. And from here and there also I kept growing, but I cannot change what I do. The only thing, and also like by nature, I'm very critical, but I wouldn't call a lot of what is going now like a genuine critical movement. I think it's more of a, I, I, I always saw my work as political, but more on, on a private, uh, from a private point mm. of view and mm -hmm. not not whatever you read in the newspaper. I don't, I don't, I don't think this is a much of a critical uh, or like a genuine way to see the world. Uh, so for me, there is nothing, also like I never sold much. So these changes in selling were never my problem. They were always my problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found ways like uh, to sell stuff, all kinds of creative ways that are quite complicated. I also do performances and I get money if people offer to me to make something or mm -hmm. uh, I sell sometime under the table, but uh, I don't, I don't know. But this table, but uh, I, I trust nobody will watch it. So uh, I don't know, uh, it's, I cannot change what I am, and I'm not going to try to join a community by the title of what it is, because it will bring me great misery. So, uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the more I do what I do, the better I feel. So it's going well. It's not okay. Better, but okay. yeah. That sounds very normal, but on the other way, it sounds also very significant for a today's artist position in society. I mean, we, uh, I, I, you mentioned this very beautiful um, phrase, uh, the professional unemployed. I mean, this seems to be a very, very nice description of, of the ambivalent role, also financially ambivalent role of the artist in this kind of post-capitalist society. Yeah, so it, yeah. yeah. it is a... Um... But I think uh, there are many people like me. We are just a silent majority. Okay. Yeah. Carlos, will you try to step in? Uh, if I'm also unemployed. Well, uh, I, I do agree with Karen on that one. I think that most artists are professionally unemployed. Uh, and most artists, although they don't admit it, they don't, they don't sell much. So that is a, that's a, a major part of the majority of the artists. Um, no, well, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to the event. It is quite early, and that made me uh, question my own sense of uh, you know, what am I doing with my life again? Because it's really thought <laughs> at 7 or 6 in the morning or whatever it is at the moment here. Uh, and maybe I was, I'm doing something wrong because this is seriously early to, <laughs> to be working. But... Um, to, to um, okay, not 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 trying to be funny now. I'll try to just put forward a very straight message of uh, the question of identity and what uh, I personally uh, take from it, of how I understand it. Um, because for me, it's both personal as a, a political future, a strong future subject. Uh, saying that, it's not just a future subject because it's been questioned for ages and um, uh, for example this guy uh, Lisa has been working about the Caribbean discourse or theories of archipelagos as ways of building identities for 
decades. Yeah. That, that book looked pretty new, but it's very old. Um, so what I was going to say. Um, so I approach it in a quite an awkward point of view. First, because if you look at me, I'm from that privileged uh, part of society, which um, has life quite facilitated. You know, I'm white, I'm blonde, I'm Westerner, I'm European, I'm from a very peaceful country, although not very wealthy in European standards. Um, and such probably don't have the same questions that uh, 80% of the world would have when they are speaking about identity um, or about life in general. Um, there is an artist that I always go back to when I start thinking about the role of me as an artist and about questions of how you how do you separate art from uh, your own identity and it's a Taiwanese artist called Te Xing Hsien uh, that has a beautiful performance uh, that um, he took 17 years to do it and he starts by making a big event and announcing the beginning then he vanishes and then 17 years after he makes mm -hmm. another big event and he announces the end during those 17 years he literally you know just as Karen was saying, he just let himself do whatever was coming, which whenever it was happening, not worried about art whatsoever. He would work in kitchens. He would, you know, like teach. He would do whatever he wanted. So for me, for me, that is the the main role of the artist. It's just, you know, like you take what you're given, and you find ways to actually do something with it. You you, you don't have to be producing a painting if that's not what. Uh, is coming your way or it's not the way you want to express yourself at that given moment um, that now uh, uh, even more boring part of the introduction of my introduction which is um, for me question identity is super problematic nowadays because we we tend to associate our own personal identity with the identity of the spaces we were born or the stereotypes of the peoples we're supposed to be a part of or represent. And this, in a way, amputates our own possibilities to transform and build ourselves in, into a more uh, egalitarian and global future, because there's no other way. You know, we're going towards the global. And in my view, we have to start assuming that the cultures that we see as being specific to sub certain peoples should be able to be in our reach to help to build our own personal lives as long as we are doing it with respect and not just out of trend or fashion. So, um, leaving on that uh, high, so, so you would, note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you would say that uh, you, you feel it's legitimate to, in a way, uh, n not appropriate, but deal with foreign cultures. I mean, we should also mention that from Portugal, you moved to Moscow, which is also a mix of, of two different historical cultural traditions. And, and that the hybridization uh, seems to be a very, I mean, all of you have this kind of mix of uh, uh, one one uh, culture as a resource, and then in another culture, an education, or a turning to a kind of Western uh, structure of art education, mixing, uh, I don't know, Japanese art with uh, modernist art, mixing um, um, other cultural backgrounds. So, so hybridity seems to be a very important aspect. Well, hybridity is something that we cannot escape. You only need to watch TV to start getting influence and start changing your way of seeing and your way of doing things. What I, I don't defend an assimilation or absorbing of other people's culture, um, but that is, it's quite a complicated subject for such a short amount of time because when you're speaking of culture, you're speaking about a group of specific predicates, you know, a, a, a very large group of characteristics all put together as represent representative of people from a specific geographical or geopolitical location, you know, and that alone is problematic because you're creating a stereotype about those people. What I defend is that from within those specific cultures, people took locally millennia to develop specific 
characteristics that can be a tiny little twist on things, you know, like the idea of the uh, of the Japanese about craft, which is a, an object of beauty in its imperfection. You know, that is a tiny little bit that you can absorb into your own uh, day-to-day dealing with things. You know, like step by step, you can build yourself or your own community into a nicer, better, more beautiful, more uh, peaceful. Um, Space. Mm. So. Carlos, the author you referred to was was uh, Glisson. Yes. Uh, yep. Could you might might be make a short note uh, here in the talk for the guests we have, if just in case if they uh, want to refer to this book. Lisson actually is one of the big uh, proponents of, of a kind of hybrid uh, cultural practice. I guess from the States, sounds in the moment very normal. An, an American artist, America dominated the art world since 80, 80 years or even more. Um, but also you have a Philippine background, uh, and might be if you tell us something about your experiences with today's artistic identity. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here to talk about this, since identity is has been at the core of my work, even though my work uses a lot of cartography and maps as a visual um, source. Um, the essence of my work is about identity. And in the, um, in the beginning, when I was an artist um, or studying to be an artist, I grew up in Texas, and then I went to undergraduate school in New York, and then graduate school in California. And growing up, trying to understand identity, I was trying to understand my place as an American, uh, being a, a Filipino. Um, and not only that, traveling around the United States, I realized that not only am I a Filipino American, but I'm a Filipino American. Texas, a Texan also, which is a very different um, um, identity than you would see in New York or California. Carlos, I, I really love what you said about um, the differences between culture and identity. This is a very uh, important distinction to make um, because you end up dealing with stereotypes in a way. And for me, um, I was trying to understand what those stereotypes were what are the stereotypes of a Texan identity or of an American identity that I can adhere to? The thing is, is that this was, um, when I was in school, this was in the mid nineties. And as I look back on my work for the past uh, few decades, the meaning of what it means to be American has changed. Mm. All of those stereotypes that I've kind of searched for have changed. Um, so, these parameters that define uh, the culture that I'm living in are constantly changing. It's a constantly moving target. Um, so now I find myself in a situation where I'm not trying to define, define myself as a Filipino American um, or as a Californian that has roots in Texas and um, New York, but rather what my role as, as a citizen is which is also very, very different. Um, and um, part of this exploration that I've been looking into was um, looking at the, the powers that a citizen has in the country. And uh, part of this is two bodies of work where I'm working with gerrymandered congressional districts um, and protest marches. And I'm making maps of both of these. Um, in a sense, your main voice as a citizen in a democratic country um, is your vote. Is and your what? Your vote. Your, your vote. vote. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's your main voice. If that voice is being manipulated um, and somehow changed, construed to push towards a, a particular agenda, then the only other recourse you have is to protest and march. 
And so these two bodies of works that I'm, in, I'm dealing with, um, they, they're both maps, you know, I mean, essentially, I'm still dealing with maps, but the essentially, two bodies of works are very different, but they play the same side um, or them, they play uh, this polarity that we have as citizens between our vote and then our protest, protestations for, the, for what we want in, in this country or in, in our country that we live in. Um, and th so that's where I find myself right now in terms of dealing with identity. It's constantly changing. It's constantly moving. So all I can try to figure out is how I'm navigating between these polarities. Um, now, how that feeds into the identity of an artist um, and what that means. I think that's also changing, too. You, you know, you've said it many times earlier today, Stefan, about um, the, the ongoing economic changes in the, in the art world. But it's not just that. I it, mean, it craft is changing. Our, our definition of what is an executable artwork is constantly changing. Um, so I, perhaps our job as artists is to kind of figure out in this moment what this means. I mean, you talk about the dialectics between vote and protest. If I look at the development, especially in the U.S., uh, and especially in the moment, I mean, I don't know how you see it, but it seems, again, tightening up uh, towards a right-wing direction. I mean, we learn more and more about governors who are more radical than we ever imagined a governor would be selected, elected. Um, is there a tendency for more protest and and uh, less trust in vote? Because also as an artist, I mean, you can uh, think, I mean, we, we, it started in the 80s, if I think of the eight, eight, uh Act Up campaign. Uh, I mean, this is my generation. Uh, um, political protest was of is essential importance of, of artistic activity. And remember that we have this, we had these artists like Felix Gonzalez Torres who anonymously participated in the political battle but had a very explicit identity as an artist. So, so here we had very strange identities. I mean, the anonymous identity as someone who participated in a political protest um, and on the other hand, the traditional role of the artist. So do you think there is, is a growing force to, to move into protest because democracy is in crisis? Oh, I think it's always been there. I think, okay. um, I think this um, artist as protesters is the, have, have always been there. Um, okay. if, I, if I just think of my own upbringing as a uh, Filipino, the act of being an artist is... A political act already. It, mm. I'm already I'm pushing back against the stereotypes of my culture. Of in the United States, the stereotype of most Filipino Americans is to become a nurse or in the health, healthcare field, and I shunned it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in that world at all. I'm an artist, and that act itself is already very political and counter to um, the, these cultural stereotypes, which we kind of use as parameters for or to define these identities. So um, that in itself is already an act of, of, of political resistance. Um, and I, I think that it that is has always been a part of art. Um, probably as much as language is as much of a part of being human and using that language to protest. Uh, okay, so, thank you for we have a little bit uh, to look at the at the, at the clock, uh, uh, Lordy. Sorry, uh, because we we should listen to uh, Ted Sonari uh, so that we have a kind of final, you know, final collection of impressions, which you take with you when you leave this talk. Uh, but thank you for the moment, Ted. Yeah. What what can you uh, contribute? I mean, we collected some some beautiful observations. I like very much the idea that being an artist is already a political act. 
Um, I, I notice also that all of you are very skeptical to to kinds of uh, sudden changes and the, the art world changes. And, and it seems listening to you that the art world doesn't much change so much and doesn't change so, 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 so drastically. Um, what are you, your, your impression, Ted? What, what, what is what you ask, you mean? No, I mean, uh, the, the, the question about uh, how, how do you deal with these issues of, of identity? I mean, I imagine that the ton of tension from, from between Japan and, and Prague uh, is, is quite big. Uh, and, and a very simple question, why Prague? I mean, there is The Hague, there's Rotterdam, there's London, uh, there's Berlin, and you end up in Prague. So why, why Prague? Okay, if, if you ask why Prague, then it, it would take time. So we will talk to later, but in a really short way, uh, I had a connection, like a spiritually or identically or family connections. <laughs> and that's the simply, simply this is the reason. And, I, and I also many Japanese students wanted to go to the West Europe. Then I felt like, okay, I felt like enough. So I was looking for somewhere where I feel... Interesting. That's the reason why it's a blog. And uh, the identity about the private or social identity for the artist, and that's always a question. But my personal one, like I, I grew up in Tokyo, and my mother's side is from the uh, Buddhist monk family, and the father's side from the sculpture, which is like, you know, the sculpture has like simply modeling and the carving. Yeah, The modeling mm -hmm. is like you add, you at paste and copy at the carving <coughs> carved stones or, or wood whatever really the natural substance which you never can come back once it's done and it's it's connects on the earth or the nature or everything what's in what's in real <laughs> this is the yeah the combination of my identity at that time of already the hybrid right from mother and father side and connection with the society. Yeah, from that that point, yeah, I would like to focus on that uh, physical sense that you can have in the relationship with your object or work and you and in the process of this the creation <coughs> and this dialogues is really the important in in, in artist or in I think for, for everybody. In in that point, what you have, what you can feel, and uh, recreate the your method and the idea and developing. This is what I'm really keen on and exciting of why I'm keeping. I think. And about art, the the this word art is running too strangely. I think that uh, depend on who you are or from which field, the word art is different. For example, just the philosophically sentence of art, like a definition or a theory, and art for that like artistic action, like innovation and the, this kind of creative work, or like the artists, like professional full-time artists, they use a different way of art, right? And the, the art market, this art, this is really also sort of different, right? So that people they sometimes confuse about what is art, what we should do. But let's divide it into a few pieces, then think back so that you can see from the broader eye, then come back together, then let's discuss again. Uh, I think that's a three time, a three minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks. Good. Yes. So much more. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So we finished this this <coughs> round, and uh, it seems that the world doesn't change so fast uh, that I expected. Um, see, things for you seem to be much more normal. Um, I, I collected some very nice uh, impressions. Uh, uh, yeah, the the instable role of all the artists. I mean, you 
you talked about the prof professional unemployed. Um, but yes, we should be aware that uh, th there is no stable position uh, uh, for the artistic profession in that society. And, and that is very much, I mean, uh, Karen talked about commissioned work. There's very much uh, also this role of, you know, having someone who makes you work, who invites you to do something. So the project, I think, uh, is, is, is a very important aspect in the moment. Um, apparently, we go to the global. Car Carlos, you said that there, there's a mo movement to the go global. But, but the famous, the famous one step uh, in front and, and two back. I mean, we go global. But on the other hand, I mean, looking at the Benali in the moment, uh, the, the regional seems to be a very, very important aspect of, of uh, uh, today's languages. So, of so course, but only because you are more aware globally of the region, of the region. Okay, yeah. If you don't so, so that would globally be the aware of the regional, then you cannot give it space within what you would consider usually the global history, mm. isn't it? So, because you know, like we got to the point where we, where we decided that Western history is not global history as it's been taught sure. for centuries, and now you have to intertwine it with all the local histories, not just of these geopolitical locations, but of the different cultures that exist in these spaces. That's why you're seeing so much of this regional, um, uh, or, or there's such a strong focus on the regional at the moment. It's, yeah. fi it's finally being brought up into you know, the place it should always have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it always relates to to you know, the disappearance of some very Western modes of thinking, like the linearity of historical development, uh, the one big uh, history of the world, uh, the idea of progress, all these big narrations apparently uh, are broke. And and suddenly we, we much more work with Kind of fragmentary histories, so so we have many histories to follow, and actually, when you refer to local tradition, it's also a way to refer to a local history, and and make a kind of montage between between different histories and between different developments. And don't you think that in the moment you work like this, you also create a specific type of the producer and a specific type of identity. I mean, is there a contemporary practice in this hybrid world, which in a way, in the moment you do something, um, you, you, you also acquire a different identity. I mean, there's this very close production and identity in a way, whatever you do, it produces also. Your identity, does it? Of course. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to answer this, but uh, in my case, this search for identity, because it's also it's it's not just about social awareness; it's also about own biography. This search for identity then, you know, is manifested through the the work I produce. Uh, I'm not sure if I can show. The yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, there is this kind of ambivalence in talks like this. I mean, uh, when Karen started to talk, there's, there's, I mean, in your practice, you produce your identity. You don't really reflect on that in terms of, oh, here. Yeah, I'll just keep it for oh, one second uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take it out. Yeah, because you might you might say a word about the hybridity of these carpets, which is quite important, is it? Yes, of course. So the, this project started when I fell in love with the, what what is named an Afghan war rug, which I found in a dingy basement in the middle of the east end of London, in a very bad state, and um, I fell in love so much with it that I decided that I wanted to work about it, but I, I didn't want to, again, assimilate that uh, um, 
the object itself as it was produced in the Middle East because it was very important. It, it appeared in, during the Soviet Union's invasion and it was a way for the local people to, to maintain themselves, to get some money in the middle of a war, but also to send both from the Soviet side as well as from the Western backers to send to the outside world small images, woven images of their own social reality. So what was happening there? You know, you have you had rugs with tanks in them and uh, with maps saying where the armies were, and, but always in a non-partisan way because they wanted the Soviets to buy it as mementos and they wanted the Americans, the Italians, the Germans to buy them uh, as a way of helping the resistance, let's say. Anyway, so that's the, the side of the Soviet um, of the Afghan war rugs. In my case, I wanted to work with them because I fell in love with it. I thought that there was something that touched my own sense of identity there. So I went looking within my constructed identity what I had uh, an inane knowledge of in terms of rug making. And in Portugal, like even children know about this specific little cross stitch technique that we call a rayonge. You almost every single household has one of these. It's part of it's an icon of Portuguese culture, you know. Um, and when I'm trying, I could speak for hours about this specific project, but I'm going to try to shrink it. Uh, so, for example, when I started researching, even the Portuguese tradition, I ended up finding out that it is something that was left in this geographical area by the, the Berber, the, the Muslim people that came from North Africa and lived here for 900 years when they were, let's say, expelled during the Inquisition into the interior of the country. Uh, and when they were expelled, they were forced to leave looms and all the materials behind, so they had to develop a new technique. So in a very, very succinct way, this is um, roughly what happened. So iconic from Portuguese culture, iconic from Afghan Middle Eastern culture, actually have a similar common background. And in my rugs, what I do is I try to reconnect them again uh, through the symbolism of the object and of the idea of the commerce of the object and what then it shows there. Yeah. So in a very... Yeah, and then while you talk, I, <clears throat> I get the impression that uh, the practice you describe position you in a very specific way as an artist turned you into a very specific uh, character as an artist. And, and so for me, it's the, the relation between uh, defining an identity and practice is, is very apparent here. And um, it might also be that, you know, as we look at the works, we understand how they were produced. And when we know how they are produced, uh, we, can, we can see the identity of the artist through production. I mean, it's so difficult to explain you your own identity if you, you don't... You can see a tiny bit of the identity of the artist. Yes. <laughs> sure, sure. But, <clears throat> that was another tiny bit that just passed behind. <laughs> Artists have private life? Don't tell it's me. True. <clears throat> it's true. And it's sure. time to wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, are there some more observations from your side? Apparent, uh, apart from the fact that we are confronted with a very complicated issue mm. to deal with in 45 minutes. Um, the, the, are you left with some impressions uh, we should mention? Uh, the, he's in uh, performance. I think, Ted, you mentioned his work. Is, is actually a work of the 70s, was it? It's, it's a very radical, performative piece of the, the 70s. If I, no, I didn't present anything. You, Carlos, you mentioned, who, who mentioned this performance? Carlos, you were. Carlos. It, yeah, it, Carlos. Was, it, it was me, but maybe we should, um, Show uh, a photo I, I will put the name on the side, but maybe we should okay. give the opportunity for other people to speak. Otherwise, uh, they're having just a very nice early um, <laughs> I just put the, the name of the artist on okay. the on the chat on the side. Okay, okay, good, good. Good. Time is nearly over. Uh, I understand that there are little questions from your side also due to the early morning 
uh, <laughs> meeting. Um, I wonder if we have questions from our, as far as I see, six. There is one question, yeah. Can you read the question? Yes. Okay. How we, um, do you see yourself as servants to the society, as Mr. Schmidt Wolfen mentioned in his introduction? And if yes, how does this influence your artistic message? Uh, I can answer quickly I and mean... then everybody can answer quickly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I see myself, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I do uh, try to communicate with society, but I don't see society as different than me. So I try to communicate with a lot of me's, what I would like to see as a viewer or as myself. So I do try to communicate, and how does it influence? It's just the same loophole. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It, I cannot do art without audience, and the audience I see as what I think the audience should, what I would be the audience. So I yeah, don't I'm know how it's changing. I don't think how it influences. It's just part of my artistic. I never did work, even if I was five. Yeah, uh, I did it to impress my parents, maybe. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> to impress my parents, but that's a, that's not the question. Yeah, yeah. There is a question. Uh, Christina Simeon wants the mic. Uh, I just wonder how I can give her the mic. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I think I just did. Yeah. Can we hear you, Christina? Because I open the mic for you. Oh, yeah, she is. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Not anymore. <laughs> ah, again? We should hear you, Christina. It's actually my question. I didn't want to interfere and to interrupt because I really like your discourse and that's, what, uh, that's why I wrote it. I'm very, very interested about the, the way you see themselves at the public servant, more or less servant of the society. And I would like to hear your other answers as well. Thank you, Karen, for your answer. Please, who else? I mean, I, I should briefly say it's a metaphor. I, I, it's a very da dangerous work, it's a metaphor, but please, who wants to comment? What that? Oh, yeah, the public servant. I think the art was for the God, or God was making, but now we are losing the, this point, including the pray or believe on the trust. And that's why artists or society, and like we, everybody, is the retro, retrogressing the sense of that. And that's why we're getting this, this uh, social servant that we Stefan said. Yeah. And that's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and for me, you know, yes, I agree with that statement um, that artists are um, servants to society. But in terms of, um, I see it in terms of the influence. We should never be afraid of the type of influence that we can impart upon our audiences. Um, one of the biggest issues with identity that I'm always concerned with is representation. Um, I'm always asked about you know representing Filipino um, artists in a way. And I think that's so much of a burden and um, a challenge for any one person to take on. So I always tell this um, to my students that are um, somehow representing a marginalized community, that you're not representing them, you're adding to that identity. So don't be afraid to do what, to do what comes natural to yourself because you're adding to that in the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, the, the, the word servant is, is a very dangerous one. I, I like much better what, what Karen said, that uh, you understand that you're part of a community. I wonder if Gauguin ever thought of being part of a community. I'm, I, I, I think he felt like an outlaw to community. And I think what has become very important is that every artist, in a way, uh, it, on a first level, is part of his or her community, which in a way creates a different identity. Dear colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, we're at the end of our time. I enjoyed very much meeting you all. Uh, I think it was a very nice experience to have you all. And uh, 
can I say have a nice breakfast after that? <laughs> okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.